Thanks for joining us. I'm Nancy Furness, and this is We've Got Issues. And We've Got Issues is a nonpartisan, citizens-based forum where we look at topics of interest to the Tri-Cities. And we'd like to express gratitude to Tri-Cities Community Television for making these interviews possible. And before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that our interviews are taking place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of Coquitlam First Nations. We thank the Coquitlam people who continue to live on these lands and to protect the lands and the waters and all that lies above and below. So this afternoon, we're joined by Paige Petru, who is running for Port Coquitlam City Council. So thank you so much for joining us today, Paige. Thank you so much for having me. And we're looking forward to learning a little bit more about you. And uh, maybe a good place to start is if you can just tell us a little bit about yourself mm -hmm. and how you've been engaged in the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm a lifelong Tri-Cities resident. I grew up in Port Moody. Um, I bought my first home in Coquitlam, so that was my move from Port Moody to Coquitlam. Spent about five years living in that community, and then we were, my husband and I, were looking for more space, looking to start a family, so we bought a larger home out in Port Coquitlam. Um, and we really fell in love with Port Coquitlam because of the, you know, you're on the waterfront, you've mm. got the rivers, you've got um, lots of trails in nature, it's a little bit quieter, a little bit of that small town feel, um, which certainly was not the case. We were living in town center in Coquitlam. So, um, so yeah, so I've been here my whole life and I run a business here. Um, one of my first jobs was working for the Tri-Cities Chamber of Commerce. So that was in the professional world where I first started to get really connected in the Tri-Cities community. Okay, well, thank you. That gives us a little bit of a sense of who you are. Mm -hmm. um, why are you running for Port Coquitlam City Council? Like, what inspired you or what what helped you to make that decision? Yeah, okay, so there's kind of two key reasons, I would say. I mean, there's always many reasons that go into a decision, but um, I've spent the last four years serving on the Mayor's Citizen Advisory Roundtable in Port Coquitlam. Um, and so through that role, uh, we're a group of volunteers that meet monthly. We provide input and feedback on some of the city's projects and initiatives. Um, and so through doing that work um, and engaging in that process, I really started to develop a passion for not only the community, but also contributing to its future um, and just gaining more of an understanding of everything that goes into running the community um, and all the decisions that are to be made. So that um, is where sort of the passion started to begin. And then also through that role, I started to receive encouragement from Mayor Brad West to put my name forward for council. Um, simply because, well, I shouldn't say simply because, but one of the reasons being that a voice um, like mine, a younger voice, a young mom, a business owner, uh, was a voice that was lacking on council, he, right. he thought. Um, and it would be a good perspective to bring to the table. Um, and so when he, when he told me that, I kind of uh, took a step back. Originally, I was very caught off guard when he, when he um, made the suggestion. Um, but I took a step back and kind of looked at you know, everything he was saying, looked at our current council, um, and, and realized that it, it is a very, the voice of young millennial women, mothers, mm. business owners is certainly lacking on our council. And it's such a big perspective in our community. I always say that um, we, you know, everything that we bring to the table is substantial and our stake in our, in our community's future is very deep rooted. Um, and so I wanted to be able to bring that voice to the council table and, um, and yeah, represent my demographic of citizens. Right, and I think it is a, a significant demographic. Um, lots of young families in Port Coquitlam right now. And definitely, if you look at the diversity on city council, you're right, there is a voice missing there. Um, so you will bring that voice to the table. Um, I want to circle back a little bit and talk mm. about the Mayor's Round Table. Mm. I, I don't know a, a lot about it, but I'm wondering, how did you get on the Mayor's Round Table? Like, what was the process or how did you find out about it and mm -hmm. how how did you get there? Yeah, um, so I, f I think I found out about it originally through the Tri-City News most likely, um, but so in 2018 when Mayor Brad West was um, elected to mayor, they made some changes around the citizen um, committees 
uh, that that were serving the city. And I don't know all of the changes, but essentially they got rid of a bunch of them and sort of amalgamated them into um, this new mayor citizen advisory roundtable mm -hmm. that wasn't necessarily specifically about um, specific initiatives, but it was more an all-encompassing perspectives of different types of um, residents and businesses. Um, and so the process was an application process. Mm -hmm. um, they put out a call. Uh, I'm not sure how many applicants they got, but I think it was quite a few. Um, and then there was, I know that um, Mayor West obviously played a significant role in going through the applicants and making sure that the round table was, had that diversity right. and um, was a group of people that was going to represent all the different interests of groups and, um, and residents and businesses in Poco. So I was selected as one of them. And I think we have, I want to say 20 people. I could mm -hmm. be wrong on that. Um, and some people, you know, with different commitments aren't always able to make every meeting. So it's hard to know exactly how many we have sometimes. Right. Um, but yeah, so, and it's been just a really great opportunity to um, to learn and grow. Oh, yeah, it's interesting. So um, just to sort of recap, so you applied for the position mm -hmm. and then was it Mayor West that made the selections? That's my understanding, but okay. don't hold me to that because I'm not 100% okay. sure what the whole process was. I'm sure maybe there was some city staff involvement, right. um, maybe council involvement, um, and, and maybe some other committees of some kind. I don't fully know what the, okay. the process was behind it, but I know a lot of it was driven by Mayor West. And the goal is to try and get diversity of voices at one table? Yeah, so um, we, sorry. Oh, sorry, no, I was just going to say, and the other part of it, you had said that there were committees, individual committees before, mm -hmm. with community representatives on them, mm -hmm. and those were collapsed down, and then now there's this one round table where you have um, a variety of different voices mm -hmm. around the table. Mm -hmm. um, you said that you were talking about different initiatives and providing input. Mm -hmm. Can you give us some examples? I'm, I'm not sure what goes on around the round table. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe give us some examples of the types of initiatives or some of the types of input that you were able to provide? Yeah, so um, there's been a whole host of things, but generally what will happen at our meetings, we, the committee or the roundtable members will come up with certain topics and things of, you know, they've heard in the community or um, maybe issues or concerns or um, things they want to learn more about. And then the city uh, will send, you know, one of their staff people to do a presentation to educate us, um, give us a little bit of insight in whatever the project concern issue is, um, and then we'll give our feedback and, and have a discussion. So some of them have been, of course, the housing, right. um, housing affordability and housing stock. Um, and we'll talk more about we'll that. We'll talk more about bit. that, of course. Yeah. Um, so that's been one where they've reached out to us for feedback. Um, one, of course, has been a lot of the revitalization projects around the Downtown right. Core, Lee Square, um, the new community center, of course. Um, so just input on the designs and the vision for those, mm -hmm. which have been really fun discussions. Um, one recent one we had was around the Freshet, which was a, a right. brand new thing to me. Right. I had never really known much about Freshet. So we had a presentation on that to learn about the risks around the flood flooding. Risks and, yeah, which is always mm -hmm. a concern to many residents in Poco and being on the floodplain exactly. and that sort of thing. So I will say for me, it really, really calmed any sort of anxieties that I had about flood risks. So obviously I won't get into all of the nitty gritty details and I probably would do a very bad job <laughs> repeating them. Well, I think the point is that you're learning exactly um, yeah. about a lot of different things that you wouldn't necessarily have been exposed to before. Yeah. Uh, so the input that you give, how is that used? Like, where mm -hmm. does that information go? Can you just walk us through mm -hmm. um, what happens after you provide the input or have these presentations? Mm -hmm. Then what happens? Yeah. So uh, to my knowledge, we there's always uh, meeting minutes that are created, and then those go to Mayor West, um, and he will review them. Um, probably, you know, consider it against discussions he's had with council and um, other residents and just, you know, use it as a way to engage with um, citizens. You know, right. it's just another opportunity to hear. It's not only about our individual perspectives, but our perspectives based on discussions with our network of people as well. So you go out and talk to people in yeah. the community about this and then bring it back to the table? Exactly. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. And where could somebody, where could the public find out more about this? Like um, you said, there's minutes. Mm -hmm. Are those available for people who might be interested in learning more? It mm -hmm. Sounds like you learn about some really interesting things. Mm -hmm. um, where can we find out that information? That's a great question. I know there is some information on the web, on the Port Coquitlam website um, about the Mayor's Citizen Advisory Roundtable. I'm not sure if they do put the meetings publicly mm -hmm. online. I'd have to check into that. Um, but of course, you can always contact the city, contact the mayor's office. They're all, they're so great. All the staff is so great at being able to answer any questions, um, especially from residents and businesses. So I would encourage people to reach out to um, someone from from City Hall and okay. get any information that they. So if for. somebody was interested in learning more about the roundtable or wanted to see some of those discussions and the decisions, then they could go to City Hall and request those and, and learn more. I'm assuming. I don't want to okay. I don't want to speak on behalf in right. case there are some confidentiality. You know, some of the stuff we discuss um, is a little bit more closed door or we might be privy okay. to like some things that aren't necessarily public yet, just depending on what the topic is. That doesn't come up very often. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to say like, absolutely right. go. Don't say anything. That you yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. I don't want to get in trouble, yes, no. but um, for the most part, yeah, absolutely. It, okay. It's definitely a very, um, the, the idea is to, to um, have citizen engagement, so to hear from right. all different kinds of people. So it sounds like that's a very valuable experience for you. Um, now running for city council, mm -hmm. you've, um, I don't know, built some relationships with city staff. You've had the opportunity to hear about some of the issues and learn and to provide your own input. Mm -hmm. What else, I mean, that's a lot of experience right there, but how else have you been preparing for the election? It's coming up fast yes. and I know you've been out in the community. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you've been doing, and maybe also um, a little bit about what you're hearing from people. Mm -hmm. What are the issues and concerns that they're sharing with you? Yeah. So the biggest thing I've been doing is, like you said, just talking to as many people as I can, mm -hmm. getting out to a community events um, put on by all the different, you know, great groups that we have, Tri-Cities Chamber, um, of course, a lot of the city events, um, and having as many conversations as I can, using social media. I know I'm of the younger generation, <laughs> so with, there's a lot of discussion that but I'm able to... it's a powerful it really is, yeah. it's, type of communication. Yeah, right? it's yeah. a great way to connect. I mean, we have a lot of really good um, community uh, groups on Facebook. I know my community in Fremont, and there's a great one, Citadel, and more of a general POCO one. Um, so taking the time to, to have conversations on there it can be very va valuable. Mm -hmm. um, and then just direct, re reaching out directly to a lot of people that I know right. and just asking people what are their concerns because I know my concerns, right? right? Like I have my own perspective that I can bring to the table, but I don't need to learn more about that. I want to learn about, you know, what other people are, are see issues with or what mm -hmm. their priorities are. Um, and I think that's just a really valuable learning experience for me to see how much they match up with my own. Um, and also to, if they don't match up with my own, to learn more it about that viewpoint. your perspective. Yeah, too. exactly. So what are you hearing from people? What are they concerned about? Yeah. I mean, the top one, of course, is affordability. Mm -hmm. It's just such a hot topic. We've had um, just crazy inflation, of course, over the last little while. Um, affordable housing is always a topic of concern. So, you know, people want Port Coquitlam to be a place where you can raise a family. And I say on top of that, we want Port Coquitlam to be a place where um, you not only raise a family, but you can retire and thrive mm -hmm. in the community. And when your kids have kids and you have grandkids, you can still... Um, you know, in, live in Poco and, and have a, uh, you know, a great life and have affordability in you that know, stage of life. I think you bring up a really good point because we do talk a lot about affordability crisis um, and it oftentimes focuses on younger families who are really struggling to get into the housing market. Mm -hmm. But there's the other end of the spectrum too when you're, um, you know, at the end of your career or right. maybe retired and what if you can't afford your home at that point? So yeah. it's kind of looking at the full spectrum mm -hmm. and I think sometimes that that seniors and falls off the radar a little bit. Yeah, the interesting thing I'll just say is that was one of the first discussions we had as the round table in 2018, which clearly it was still an issue back then. Right. Um, and there was a round table member who um, volunteers with the seniors groups and he had voiced sort of it's very similar to right. what you just said that um, there's affordability issues around seniors and mm -hmm. um, living on pensions and that sort of thing and I was sitting there listening to it and I said to the group you know this is so interesting because everything you're saying 
resonates with me. It's the same right, challenge the of people in my stage of right. life. So, you know, we're always more similar or more alike than we are different. Finding that common ground, right? Yeah, exactly. What kind of housing does Port Coquitlam need? Mm -hmm. Like, what is, uh, you know, maybe you don't have 100% of the answer, yeah. but what would you like to see as far as the type of developments or, or housing that goes into Port Coquitlam? Yeah, so, okay, one of the presentations we had around the housing stock really gave me a little bit of perspective on this. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, we need more um, family homes, two, three bedroom, four bedroom homes um, right. that are suitable to raise a family in. But I'll say something that probably doesn't get said more often, which is um, you have a lot of seniors or retired um, people, empty nesters, that are mm -hmm. living in these large family homes, five bedroom homes, that are getting to a point in their life where they're saying, this house is too big for me. Right. I don't need this much space. Um, I would like to downsize, but I have nowhere to go. Um, I want to stay in Port Coquitlam. Based on their lifestyle, maybe they don't want to live in an apartment. Um, they don't necessarily want to live in a strata. Maybe when they're a little bit older into their right. super senior years, they might want to, but they're still young and active and they want to have a yard and have their grandkids over and that sort of thing. So um, I remember asking one of the people on the round table, being like, well, what, what kind of housing are you looking for? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, they say bungalows, you know, smaller ranchers. detached homes, yeah. ranchers. So I think it's an an important thing to look at. I don't, uh, of course, it's not the answer to everything, but if we do have more housing stock that is more suitable to these empty nester downsizers, of course, mm -hmm. if they're moving through the market, they're opening up some larger family homes. So it's, it's you know, I'm sure there's a lot more economic analysis that would go right. into it, but, but it's an interesting put some thought into it, yeah, right? And exactly. um, sometimes you have to get a little bit creative. What do you think about uh, co-op housing and, and those sorts of options? Do we have enough of that in Port Coquitlam? Do we have any of that in Port Coquitlam? I don't think right now there's ever enough of that, sadly, which mm -hmm. is a very sad truth. Um, so I think it's definitely something that Port Coquitlam can continue doing. And I know I shouldn't say I know, but I believe in the OCP, we have, you know, a certain amount of rental housing mm -hmm. um, based, you know, when you're doing a new development, a certain amount has to be, you know, family friendly units and a certain amount has to be rental. I Don't quote me on that because I'm quoting the right. OCP, but I don't know 100 percent. But I know it's a, a topic that's come up in a lot of discussion around making sure that we have enough um, rental housing. But that doesn't necessarily mean co-op housing, like you're saying. Right. It's a little bit different. Yeah. So I, I think that we probably don't have enough. It's, okay. it's an issue that is... It, it kind of pulls at my heartstrings because it's something that there's so many needs in our community and there's so many people that need that kind of housing and it, it, it just never seems like there's ever enough. Well, that kind of leads to a question that's a little bit related. Mm -hmm. When we have development happening in the city, mm -hmm. are we asking enough of the developers? Mm. Like, is that somewhere that maybe, you know, at the municipal level, maybe mm -hmm. that's, is that somewhere where you think there's room for improvement? I, there could be. I know, I will say I know that Poco's done a really good job of um, creating those um, guidelines for developers and holding their feet to the fire and making sure mm -hmm. that there is a certain um, percentage of homes that meet certain types of demand. Mm -hmm. um, so I will say that council has done a good job on that compared to maybe some other municipalities. But I think there's, I just think there's always more that can be done. Right. Um, you know, these developers are, of course, making a lot of money and they're contributing to our community and our city. And I think being able to get collaborative at the table mm -hmm. um, and, and make sure if there is a big need for something, you know, working together with them and making sure that we have that right. in our community. Now, I've noticed um, throughout your platform is sort of um, inclusivity and accessibility. Um, you've talked about trying to bring people together in the community. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on that? What do we need to do to bring this community together and make sure that everybody feels welcome? Mm -hmm. Accessibility to me is such an important conversation to have. Um, and when I talk about accessibility, I'm thinking everything from financial accessibility to, you know, people with disabilities, both mental and physical, right. developmental challenges, um, newcomers, refugees, elderly, you know, there's so many different groups, First Nations, all of those different groups that, you know, things might not be mm -hmm. accessible to them in the same way they're accessible to other 
people. Um, so to me, I and I think that looking at all the decisions that we're making, all the project or yeah, all the projects and initiatives and decisions around those, just looking at them through that lens of right. you know like. If someone has a child with autism, are they gonna? How how does this um, environment like, affect their ability? Can they use this park or yeah. this amenity? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So, and it's definitely something that's very personal to me. And so, I it, and it, it, like I said, it, there's so many different types of accessibility issues, um, and it's just something that needs to be on the forefront when right. making those decisions because it's so easy to forget these people. Mm -hmm. um, and when you put yourself in their shoes, the amount of challenges that they hit just in any given day, you know, going through our community, it can be very significant. Right. Now, as far as park spaces, mm -hmm. um, how do we make those more accessible? Mm -hmm. Is there are there certain things we can do to make sure that people feel welcome in the parks? Um, I think Pogo is a very welcoming um, community for sure, especially when it comes to parks. We have a lot of really great just open green spaces. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think the biggest thing on parks and green spaces is just maintaining maintaining them. You know, right. obviously everyone in Poco, I think, loves that Poco has so many green spaces and parks and playgrounds, and it is very family friendly. And I think it's important to keep it as a priority so that it stays that way when we're looking at projects and development. Um, and, and on the accessibility front, you know, looking at things like, you know, if there's... Um, stairs or right. or you know different obstacles so very know. practical yeah. things that we can actually do yeah so, exactly okay. yeah um sort of now we're talking a little bit about um accessibility and, and green spaces mm -hmm. and things like that let's move on to downtown revitalization mm -hmm. there's a lot of changes going on downtown mm -hmm. um can you share some thoughts on how you feel about that mm -hmm. I'm personally very excited about the vision that I've heard about um, for the downtown core. Um, I think that it does need some revitalization, mm -hmm. um, something that, you know, projects and um, development that's going to make it more welcoming, going to attract more types of businesses that are just going to make it, uh, you know, more walkable, more, you know, whether it's cafes or shops or um, restaurants, that sort of thing, um, to really draw people into our downtown core. Um, and then also making sure that A, it preserves the nature because Poco, that's always something that's going to be important to people mm -hmm. is having those little green spaces. And, um, you know, by no means do, do I think anyone in Poco wants a concrete jungle in the downtown right. core. I would agree with that. Yeah, Especially it, during our hotter summers and our yes. wetter winters. It's not the kind of environment that we probably are striving for. Exactly. Um, related to that, we recently have seen about 200 healthy mature sure trees come down, mm -hmm. big trees, mm -hmm. in the downtown core. Yeah. Um, people seem to be really caught off guard by that, and, and there was a lot of um, anger and frustration. Mm -hmm. Is there something you think that could be done differently going forward to make sure that that's not repeated? Mm -hmm. Well, so I don't have all of the, you know, background information on all those specific mm -hmm. trees, of course. What I will say is that I think there is such an important part of, you know, leadership in educating yourself and making sure that you have all the information, um, you know, scientifically and, and from the experts that know um, that know everything about that side of things, and then also bringing the perspectives that you hear. But so what I will say is that I know the city did do a very um, due diligent job of having a certain amount of arborists on staff. Um, and looking at the impact and uh, replanting a certain amount more and you know more than what was recommended. So when I hear that side of things, it does give me some reassurance that there was a lot of thought put into it and that it wasn't done carelessly. Um, but without having all the information and being able to sit down with the city staff right. and the experts and be like, you know, why, why were these trees taken mm -hmm. down? Could, was there something that could have been changed in whatever the development plans are, you know, and, and really get a full understanding of the full picture? Um, and then I think the other piece of the challenge is making sure the public, if there is, you know, more information that m m makes, more, makes it make more sense, right. making sure the public understands that because mm -hmm. the city works for the people work right. who live here. So if they don't have that information and it just looks different to them, then 
we're not doing a very good job. So how do you think the city can communicate better with the public so that um, people are really, um, you know, people would become more engaged as yeah. well and would be, um, you know, more aware of what's happening in, in the community? Is there yeah. a way to do that? I know it's always a challenge, yeah. but we've got social media. Is there some way as a city councillor that you would be encouraging the mm -hmm. city to reach out and to connect? with people? Mm -hmm. It's definitely a conversation that's come up on the round table and I'm sure has come up in all other types mm -hmm. of conversations that it is so difficult to mobilize people. People are busy. Mm -hmm. They have their lives. You know, they're not necessarily going to go to the city website to read a bulletin. They're not necessarily going to, um, you know, take the time to go to a public hearing or a council meeting. So it being able to meet people where they are in order to get their feedback is a really big challenge. But I do think, like you say, social media is a powerful tool. Um, and I know it's a delicate thing as well because um, as soon as, you know, officially there's city representatives on in different community groups, there's sort of an obligation to be a certain amount of active, right. which can be hard to keep up with. It right. takes a lot of resources and to have someone to be monitoring and responding to all of the different Exactly, concerns. moderating. Yeah. Um, I'm going to change tact yes. a little bit because we had a, a just a very brief conversation mm -hmm. um, just before the interview about community safety. Mm -hmm. And you shared some thoughts with me that I found quite interesting. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask you if you will share those thoughts again mm -hmm. and just talk a little bit about community safety. Mm -hmm. yeah. So community safety is something that has definitely come up in a lot of the conversations that I've had. Um, around people, you know, what are your concerns and priorities for the city? A lot of people are concerned about community safety in Poco. Um, and this was also uh, one of our, our presentations that we had on the round table. And it essentially, the, when you look at community safety, the crime rates based on statistics are actually going down over the recent years. And also when you look at them, the rates in Port Coquitlam compared to the rest of the region, they're actually quite low but people still cite community safety as a concern. Right. They still don't feel safe. So it becomes the issue of community safety of the perception of, of feeling safe. It's incredibly important. Exactly. Right? Even, yeah. if you're, even if people are safe and they're out in their community, if they don't feel safe, it doesn't matter whether they exactly. are or not. They're not going to go downtown. They're not going to go out and be yeah. in the community. So yeah. it's a hugely important thing. Is there something... No, our time is... <laughs> <laughs> almost out here and we okay. have so much to talk about. Mm -hmm. Is there something just very briefly that can be done to change that perception? I think it's something that the, our local um, community police are. It's very much on their radar and they're working on. Um, I think just a presence in the community would really help, um, you know, whether it's at different community events or just out, um, you know, monitoring during the day. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I think that it's probably a complex thing to tackle, um, but I know there are steps being done and I think that they should continue. And I think the first step is just what you've said is the perception, like we are under the perception of maybe that um, spaces aren't safe when in mm -hmm. fact they are very safe. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have, I have two more questions. Okay. So one is just going to be a real quick okay. um, one. What is Port Coquitlam's biggest environmental challenge right now? Oh, I mean, I, when it comes to climate action in Poco, it's for me personally, I am so overwhelmed by mm -hmm. climate climate change. That a lot of, yeah, it's, it's a yes. huge issue. It's the entire globe. Um, and so it often feels like, well, whatever we do in Poco is a drop in the bucket. But at the same time, everyone needs to do their part, whatever right. it is, whether it's, um, you know, the charging stations for um, electric vehicles and making, you know, that um, type of transportation a more uh, accessible. Um, and there's something the city, a role the city can play in that yes, as well, providing more EV charging stations and... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, and even something as small as that, if it's something we can do, it contributes right. to the solution. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. A lot of small contributions add up to yeah. something significant. Yeah. Um, I have one last question that we always ask, and it's around a respectful workplace. Mm -hmm. So you may be entering a new realm where you're working around um, a little bit different of a, a table mm -hmm. with uh, some colleagues, mm -hmm. and you may not always agree. Yeah. So there are decisions that need to be made 
um, and maybe you won't agree with all the decisions. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the issues can get contentious a little bit. Mm -hmm. How will you handle those types of situations? And mm -hmm. what do you bring to the table to um, sort of ensure that those situations can be worked through? Yeah. I think that, first of all, like leaving the ego at the door, <laughs> like nothing is personal about the issues we're talking about. Um, and disagreeing is inevitable, and it's actually a good thing at these types of tables because you want to be able to have that open discussion and, you know, being respectful and having integrity. Um, if we can't have those open discussions free of judgment, we're never going to evolve and get anywhere. Mm -hmm. so, sort of a safe space. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. And I mean, I, that's always a value of mine in everything, you know. I mean, we talk about, you know, mental health and destigmatizing and like all these other issues. The key thing is having a safe space, no judgment, open, um, respectful conversation. And so I think that just reminding everyone of that, um, and, you know, if things do get contentious, it, it's... It's all for the greater good. We just need to right. all be respectful of each other and hear each other. And there is a lot of talk about having some municipal oversight or some provincial oversight, mm -hmm. I should say, and having like an integrity commissioner or somebody who's an independent third party come mm -hmm. in and provide some oversight and some guidance mm -hmm. in the situations where hopefully they won't occur. But if there is a situation occurs that can't be resolved around the council table, would you be supportive of that? I think it's sad <laughs> that a group of adults need to be babysat. Um, but of course, yeah, if, if people aren't feeling comfortable or safe in, when they come to work in their job, then absolutely action needs to be taken to ensure that, that they are. And, you know, there's so many different tables. And, of course, we can't speak to every single closed room um, and what takes place inside of them. But, um, of, of course, I would be supportive. I think that that's a very important, um, important piece of what we do. Okay. Well, I would like to thank you so much, Paige, for taking the time to come in and, and talk with us this afternoon. Um, I think we've got a good sense of who you are and, and where you would like to see things go. Mm -hmm. So we'll wish you all the very best in your campaign. Thank you so much. I appreciate uh, you having me. Thanks for joining us. I'm Nancy Furness on We've Got Issues, and we've been talking with Paige Petru, who is running for Port Coquitlam City Council.